Yeah, the way I think about data security is that it's utilizing technology to make sure that data is encrypted. It's behind a authentication and authorization shield to prevent unauthorized access to data and modification of that data. The way I think about data privacy is that it ensures that personal data is collected, it's stored, and it's processed in compliance with privacy regulations, like the favorites, GDPR, CCPA, HIPAA, and a few others. Hey, welcome back to Armchair Architects Season 4, where we're talking about security. Now, I don't think a season about security would be complete if we didn't say anything about data privacy and security. So let's get right to the architects to talk about it. Well, hello, folks. So I would love to talk about two topics that I think people sometimes use interchangeably, but really aren't, and I'd love to separate them, which is privacy and security, right? They're certainly connected, but they're not the same thing. So as we get, so let's dive into sort of that aspect, again, from an, from an architect's perspective, but first somebody help divide the two, you know, put, put them in their own separate boxes for me, please. Yeah, the way I think about data security uh, is that it's utilizing technology to make sure that data is encrypted, uh, it's uh, behind a um, uh, an authentication and authorization, um, you know, a shield to prevent unauthorized access to data and modification of that data. The way I think about data privacy is that it ensures that personal data is collected, it's stored, and it's processed in compliance with privacy regulations, like the favorites, GDPR, CCPA, HIPAA, and a few others. I would add to this where if you think about security, it's all about making sure that only authorized personnel or authorized systems have access to that data. This uh, privacy part is that if you use data uh, from, for example, a citizen, a person, you make sure that there's consent that this information is uh, secure on the one side. On the other side, it's only used for the purpose that the person or organization has consented to. And that's something that I think we have learned over the last years uh, with social security, where we know that certain abuses happened, where data was collected on kind of this pretense, and then they were, was used in another pretense. And for me, privacy has these two aspects, that it's managed securely and uh, only people that are authorized are looking at it, but also that the application or the usage of the data is in line with the um, given consent that was shared and asked for. And therefore you can trust that only the things that you authorize are being done to or with your data. So I'm digging the fact that we're sort of looking at this from different angles. I'll throw one in for myself just for fun. Cause we talked about before, like there's a difference between a privacy incident and a security incident. And one of the differences, and I think that I learned this from the book, Building Secure, I'm looking at my bookshelf, uh, Building Secure and Reliable Systems is the notion that when you have a security incident, you can, uh, Fix the problem. You can close. You can close the close the thing that that was exposing it, and and now it's closed, and now no more people won't do something with that. But when with a privacy thing, you have a release of information, and you don't get it back. You can't turn it off. You can't. Uh, there's nothing I can do at that moment to suddenly make that. You know, I might be able to like invalidate passwords, but there's not a lot I can do. If congratulations, I've given out your home address right, to, to fix that for you. I think that you're right, David, and, and something just occurred to me, and, and I'm just thinking about this from some of my experiences, like I think a privacy event in which you are, you are somehow um, utilizing, let's say, customer data, account numbers, yep. credit card numbers, social security numbers, identifiable data, you are utilizing it in an unacceptable way. So the consent in which you use to acquire that information from the customer is now being utilized potentially in you know altruistic ways by your organization, unbeknownst to the person that actually volunteered that data. So there's that's right. the first issue of, from a privacy violation perspective. The second one is if you have a data breach, which starts as a security issue, you now, if you're not looking after privacy, um, they're able to go and get some of that securely sensitive information. Um, right. And now you have, that's the that's what constitutes a breach. It's a, to me, it's a security violation and it's a data privacy violation all in one. So they're kind of linked in my mind in that respect. 
Yeah, so David, your point about the horse then having left the barn um, is very clear once information has been shared uh, that hasn't been secured properly. And again, we talked about in previous yep. episodes about, hey, if you have sensitive data, identifiable data, you should uh, en encrypt it, tokenize it, whatever the technique is you want to use, so that even if you have a security issue and a data breach, the data is not usable uh, to whoever got the data. A lot of teams haven't done this. I'm sure all of you um, and our um, viewers have had data breaches from trusted providers, be that telco providers, be that uh, healthcare providers even there, where you effectively you get a letter in the mail that says, oh, sorry, your information got uh, shared with unauthorized users. And what happens then is we all know that this stuff can happen. You should obviously put the right protection in place. Again, we talked about encryption, tokenization, uh, and Eric, I think you should talk about what tokenization really means. Um, but let me finish my thought here. Um, if you have done the right things, then the exposure of information is going to be minimal. If you haven't done the right thing, uh, or in any case, you should have a process that says, okay, we are not perfect. So if a breach happens, what is the reaction? Uh, what do we do? And I always vote for transparency. Be very clear something has happened and educate everybody what has happened and what are you doing to help? So again, how do you secure the breach and other things? And then if it's consumer data, uh, what most um, people do then is give you a subscription to a um, identity and Perfect information management yeah. service and those yeah. kind of things. And that's obviously part of what I would call a process that has to be set up a priori uh, because you don't want to do firefighting if you have a data breach. Uh, you want to be able to run through a playbook that says, okay, here's what we do, A, B, C, uh, and go from there. And I have to admit, I, I take those letters to be really cold comfort, like, cool, you've set up, a, a, you've given me a monitoring service. Oh, that makes it all better. And I and I, I know I'm just a little cynical in that way. But Eric, I agree, like, like, like we are using the term token, tokenizing. Um, and I would love to get a, a, some clarity on that. Can, can you hit that now? We'll, I'll come back to my citizen later. Yeah, the way I think about tokenization is it's one of many privacy enhancing technologies that anybody that's got a significant, sizable data estate in which you're sharing and capturing identifiable information as it relates to people or sensitive systems or transactions needs to implement. So pseudonymization and anonymization are technologies that are in this PET or privacy enhancing technology umbrella. Essentially, it utilizes tokenization as a technique potentially to replace sensitive data with non-sensitive equivalents. There might be masking algorithms. There might be ways in which you, you introduce ciphers to shift values, whatever it is. Or you might just black it out entirely uh, or not even save it uh, at all. Uh, you could do one-way hashes, two-way hashes in which you can actually go back and get the credit card information if you wanted to. Or you could say, you know what? This is a data lake. No one should ever be reporting on credit card information. Uh, and so we are going to make sure it's one way. You, you can't even see it, uh, even if you wanted to. Um, the, there is also like differential privacy, which is allows analytics without exposing individual data points. Um, but all of these elements uh, are um, ways in which the data at rest or even in transit, even if you're doing real time analytics, by the time it hits Flink or by the time it hits that sink before it gets flushed to your lake house, it should be anonymized, pseudonymized and protected. And specifically when it relates to customer data, you want to make sure that you can't do re-identification meaning that you can't look at multiple entities within the lake house and say, if I match, if I join Eric with his Xbox ID and his Microsoft 365 ID and these other elements, I can figure out where he lives. I um, de-anonymize so, it essentially. Yes, yes. It, it, it used to be called re-identification um, mm -hmm. of data. Um, that's also something that's taboo uh, in terms of making sure that you're using the data in an acceptable manner. So the, the interesting thing is lots of, developers and architects think that you have to kind of engineer these things on your own, I would strongly suggest looking at the PET uh, provider umbrella. Um, this also includes like the de the generation of tokenization algorithms. Those things are kept up to date so that you don't actually have to go invent something custom and you now you have to maintain it. Hey, let's pause here because we're out to end to a really substantial subject, namely data design. And I want to save that for a part two. So I hope you'll join us on the next episode of Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Essentials show. Mm -hmm.